you there? Hey. Why are you never telling me you coin? And I pray to God. Take me. Take me. Leave my son. Self-inflicted gunshot wound. Coming up on Chapman News, an NFL legend passed away on Wednesday. We'll have an update on the death of Junior Seau. A triple murder suspect in custody details on the chase through Orange County that led to his arrest. A bomb threat in Fullerton on Tuesday. We've got the full details. You're watching Chapman News. I'm Julie Vassera. And I'm Diane Gerstenfeld. A bomb threat in Fullerton on Tuesday evacuated a shopping center. West Rappaport was on the scene and has the update from the Fullerton Police Department. Dozens of police and emergency personnel responded to a bomb threat in Fullerton Tuesday. A suspicious vehicle was found by Cal State Fullerton Police parked behind a shopping center at the corner of State College Boulevard and Chapman Avenue. The car was said to have been propped open by a broom and upon further investigation was housing an aerosol can with wires attached to it. The car also had other unknown objects protruding from its exterior. We initiated a, an evacuation of about 330 feet and we called in the Orange County Bomb Squad. They came in and they sent a robot in to check the vehicle for safety, determined that all of the attachments to the vehicle were inert and there was no danger and we were able to take all of that off of the vehicle and make sure everything was safe. The elapsed time of the entire incident was approximately three hours from late morning to early afternoon. The name of the individual involved has not yet been released. He remains under a 72-hour psychological hold that is due to expire today. He's a male, 27 years old, who owns the vehicle, and that no criminal charges are pending as of now. There's a woman behind me standing next to the car. She appears to be the young man's mother. She declined to comment. Reporting from Fullerton, I'm Wes Rappaport, Chapman News. In addition to the shopping mall, sections of the surrounding neighborhood were evacuated, but reopened as the investigation closed. Northwood High School and neighboring homes were evacuated Wednesday evening due to a gas leak. Authorities shut down a portion of Portola Parkway in Irvine between Culver and the 261 around 4 p.m. No injuries have been reported. Families were allowed to return to their homes and Portola was opened within two hours. Officials have deemed the site safe for normal activity. Authorities are on the search for the bodies of a missing woman and her two children after questioning her ex-boyfriend in South Orange County last night. Shazer Limas is expected to be booked for murdering 30-year-old Artlet Hernandez and their two sons, a four-month-old and a two-year-old, Lemus was initially taken into custody after a chase that started in Orange County and ended in San Diego County. He was involved in a 45-minute standoff with police. The motive for the murders remains under investigation, and authorities are still searching for the victims' bodies. Why are you never telling me you coin? And I pray to God. Take me! Take me! Leave my son! NFL legend Junior Seau was found dead on Wednesday morning in what has been confirmed as a suicide in his Oceanside home. Police responded after a female, believed to be Seau's girlfriend, found him in the bedroom with a gunshot wound to the chest at 9.35 a.m. Oceanside Police Lieutenant Leonard Mata said a gun was found next to the body. When police arrived, the front of Seau's home was filled with fans, neighbors, and his family. Seau was considered one of the best linebackers of his time. He was drafted fifth overall out of USC by the San Diego Chargers in the 1990 NFL Draft and was a part of the franchise's only Super Bowl trip in 1994. Dodge College will be hosting the Community Voices screening next week in the Felino Theater. Community Voices is a social issue documentary film program which links Chapman's documentary students with Orange County-based organizations. Each semester, groups of students produce short, character-driven portrait films that highlight causes the partner organizations aim to serve. 
The films are then used in the outreach and fundraising of campaigns of the organizations, including via PBS broadcast. The screening will be on May 9th at 7 p.m., followed by a Q&A with the filmmakers. Adam Yauch, one of the third of the pioneering music group The Beastie Boys, has passed away at the age of 47, Rolling Stone reports. Yauch co-founded The Beastie Boys with Mike, Mike D. Diamond, and Adam Adra Horowitz in 1979. The band has produced many popular albums, including License to Ill in 1986, Paul's Boutique, Check Your Head, and Ill Communication. In addition to his career with the Beastie Boys, Yauk was heavily involved in the movement to free Tibet and co-organize the Tibetan Freedom Concerts of the late 90s. Coming up after the break, we'll talk with the creators of the Chapman Film Expo to find out what went into making the film. Plus, Joan Park has our weather. Joan? Why is the weather playing jokes on us? Drizzling in the morning and clouds throughout the day. Will this continue? I'll have all the answers to that and more coming up in weather after the break. Follow your dreams. Chapman University, a diverse, well-rounded education. Art, dance, music, theater. Empower your future. The performing arts at Chapman University. Create. Follow your dreams. Chapman University. History, philosophy, peace studies, languages. Study abroad and explore the world. Become a global citizen. The Wilkinson College at Chapman University. Invest your humanity. Lead. Yep. We are back. I'm Diane Gerstenfeld. And I'm Julie Vacera. Today we are joined by Joe Sill and Brian White of the controversial Chapman Film Expo. Joe directed the film and Brian was one of the producers. Thanks so, mu so much for joining us today, gentlemen. Thank you. Of course, yeah, thanks. First off, can you two describe what the Film Expo is about? Sure. Well, Expo is a 13-minute short film and it's based on the moon. And it's about a female astro miner named Shona and her efforts to try and save her daughter's life. And she's on the moon to try and make some extra money to pay for her daughter's expensive medical bills. And what happens is a new astro miner named Paige comes up onto the moon and tries to replace Shona's job, because Shona's job is up, and complications arise, and basically they have to decide whose life is more important. Now we know there was some controversy surrounding the film. Can you tell us what happened? Yeah. Um, we broke a, a few of uh, the rules here at Chapman University, but we kind of, I mean, that, that was like last semester, I believe, uh, when, we, when we ended up shooting this and, mm -hmm. and making it. But um, since then, you know, we've been editing it, and, and it's, we're really proud of what it's, what it's come to now, and we're ready to start showing people as we just finished uh, as of late. So That's great. Joe, as a director's perspective, what was it like working on a film with such heavy visual effects? Well, uh, with such heavy visual effects, you have to go into it knowing what, exactly what you want and also knowing exactly who you want on the team. So we brought on as many talented individuals as possible. Arjun Prakash, our VFX supervisor, um, he was one of the, the main key players as far as defining exactly what the VFX was gonna look like. So him and I really worked on exactly, before we even shot it, how we're gonna set up the, uh, the stage, how we're gonna set up the green screen behind it, how we're gonna set up the keying, all the masking that would go into post-production. So we really had to think you know, ahead of the game, anticipate, and really, think about what it was going to look like, even though it was just a green screen. Uh, Brian, now I know you guys brought in some props for us today. Can you tell us about uh, this piece of moon we have here <laughs> yes. and how that went into um, that? For our production designer, Alex LeBeau, who's extremely talented, um, he worked on, uh, he, we brought him on really early, I think about four or five months in advance, because we were experimenting with different types of, sur uh, of surface materials to use for, for the moon surface. And I think this, what was this, was this paper mache and like cement or something? We we have we have four or five different um, you know types of surfaces that we use. We end up going with I think flour. And this was actually cement. Yeah. That was cement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had we ended up using flour and um, a bunch of different stuff um, for the, what was the original stuff we used in the. Uh, well, we started with paper mache. Um, a friend of ours, Kellen Moore, who's actually the art director, yeah. brought that to our attention. Right. And Alex LeBeau took it, took a look at it, and he thought, you know what, concrete's actually going to be a lot cheaper. It's going to be a lot more sturdy, right. and people won't crack the actual surface when they step on mm -hmm. it. So we really needed to make sure that 
you know, the surface stayed intact when we actually like moved cameras on, moved lights on, moved actors on, so it wouldn't break apart. Right. Um, and what makes this film Expo different from other films that either of you have worked on in the past? Well, I think it's uh, the biggest project we've worked on so far. Yeah, for a, for a one weekend project, there quite a lot of uh, pre production went into it. Um, I mean, we starting four or five months out, like we talked about, and you know every single shot had to be individually planned and prepped for and, and storyboarded, and we had to know exactly what problems would arise <coughs> with each individual shot for the entire film. And so, uh, so much pre production went into just you know three or four days of shooting that. It was it was quite a huge project, but uh, I think I mean, we're pretty happy with it now. I think it's it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you guys so much for taking yeah, the time to sit down and talk to us about this. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the weather has been so hazy this week. I've been wearing my sunglasses, even though it's the sun hasn't even shined. Yes, that is correct. Joan, is it going to stay overcast, or can we expect a little bit of sun this weekend? Diane, Julie, don't worry. The sun will come out and will continue to stay out later on throughout the weekend. But for the time being, good morning, Orange. Open your windows, feel the cool breeze, take a sip of your coffee, because this is your weather report. In Boston, it will be 58 degrees with some scattered tea storms. Same for New York, Chicago, and pretty much the rest of the East Coast. Full of rain and storms, and in Dallas, it hits a high 93 with sun, sun, sun. And in Vegas, 90 degrees and also sunny. Bringing it a little bit closer to home, San Jose 52, Bakersfield 60, Los Angeles 59, and San Diego 60. All within partly cloudy and sunny weather with slightly chilly mornings. A lot different from the East Coast rains and storms. And now for our very own local orange five-day forecast. Today and Saturday will be partly cloudy in the 70s with lows in the 50s, but not to worry. Sunday will mark the start of some sunny weather at highs of 78 and 79 degrees. That will definitely continue on throughout the weekend. So basically, look forward to some sunshine and slapping on the sunscreen this weekend. See, there's nothing to worry about. The sun will come out and stay out for your weekend plans at the beach, the park, the mall, you name it. So that one, we can fully enjoy the beautiful weather that we can look forward to in the weekend. Make sure you make some weekend plans. Go to the beach, go to the mall, do whatever, but make sure you enjoy it. I'm Joan Park here with a few little ducks swimming around in the back. For Chapman News, this is your weather report. Diane, Julie, back to you. Thank you, Joan. And now we have the great honor of introducing the one, the only, Matt Pritchard. <laughs> That's right, Julie. He's usually a sports guy, but this week he's jumping on that political bandwagon and... He's leaning a little to the right. You can be, you can listen, you can judge, but I will say, leaning to the right, it's a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> After a late night landing on Tuesday, President Obama signed a pact with the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai. The agreement solidified the end of the war on terror, and the president announced he will be pulling 23,000 troops out of Afghanistan by the end of the summer. The president's... A moment for our two nations, uh, and to do so on Afghan soil. I'm here to affirm the bonds between our countries, to thank American and Afghans who have sacrificed so much over these last 10 years, and to look forward to a future of peace and security and greater prosperity for our nations. The President's surprise visit was his first since December of 2010. It also marked the one-year anniversary of the Navy SEAL Team 6 mission that claimed the life of Osama bin Laden. A New York man was convicted Tuesday of plotting an aborted suicide mission against New York City subways in 2009. A jury found Adis Medujanin guilty of all counts for his role in a terror plot that federal authorities say was one of the closest calls since the 9-11 attacks. Medujanin did call the New York City 911 dispatcher during the failed attack. Take a listen. Police operator 1673. This is a gate. Yeah. We lost this. He wants to know what? 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 Medujanin had planned with two others to strap bombs to their chests and create three separate explosions in different portions of the New York subway system. Defense attorney Robert Gottlieb stated that Medujanin was attempting to fulfill a romantic version of jihad. His plan was to join the Taliban and stand up for what he believes in. Medujanin is scheduled to be sentenced on September 7th and could face up to life in prison for the failed attack.
Occupy protesters attempted to use May 1st, a date associated with worker movements around the world, as an opportunity to reignite the public's interest in their cause. The Occupy movement organized nationwide protests Tuesday, asking Americans not to attend work or school and instead participate in a general strike intending to show the 1% what life would be like without the 99%. This is the first major demonstration held by the occupiers since last fall, and angry Occupy protesters around the United States protested against what they claim to be inequalities of wealth and corporate greed. It was reported that four protesters in Manhattan were detained by police and one female officer was struck in the head and taken to the hospital. Despite these attempts, the movement is still struggling to gain widespread public attention. Controversy swirling around the Romney campaign this week after the presidential hopeful spokesman on foreign policy stepped down. The openly gay Richard Grinnell had caused an uproar from anti-gay conservatives after he released a series of tasteless tweets about American women. Grinnell was said to have been kept under wraps by the campaign ever since the appointment began creating controversy. The Romney campaign insists that Grinnell uh, was not pushed from his post and that Romney advisors tried to convince Grinnell to stay. That's going to wrap it up for politics. Back to you, fine-looking ladies. Thank you, Matt. Last weekend, we brought you the opening of the Newport Beach Festival. And this week, Chapman News reporter Amanda Starantino gives you the close. Glitz and glam meets palm trees and good weather at the Lido Theater for the Newport Beach Film Festival. After a week long of red carpet stars and films, the 13th annual Newport Beach Film Festival closes tonight with the film Shanghai Calling. In attendance tonight were not only the actors, directors, and producers, but also a sidewalk packed with avid moviegoers. But I love it, so I'm glad to know that it's going on, you know, so we'll make it an uh, annual event from now on. Oh, we're looking forward to see Shanghai Calling. Looks pretty, uh, pretty good so far, so I'm excited to see it. Shanghai Calling brought Chinese culture to the West with a romantic comedy of discovery of love and the appreciation of Shanghai. A lot of people don't think that um, a, a story about people living in modern day China is going to be funny, but it is. It's, it's, there's all sorts of crazy misunderstandings and, and you know, holes that people fall into, and it's, it's a really funny and it's a really charming movie. Exciting. Shanghai is, is hard to describe. It's, it's, you know, it, was, it was always a world destination, and now it's kind of reclaimed that title. But. The festival lasted one week and brought in 400 films from 50 different countries. Reporting from the Newport Beach Film Festival, I'm Amanda Starantino, Chapman News. A Chapman grad worked on Shanghai Calling. Nate Orloff, a 2009 Dodge graduate, worked as the editor for the film. Don't go anywhere. The Best Campus Sports Show with Aaron Lim is next. Aaron, we got playoffs, MLB, what else? We have all that and more, ladies. Coming up this week in sports, I'll bring you the latest update in the NBA. Plus, history made in Anaheim, are the Angels getting back on track? And can Albert Pujols finally hit a home run? I'll bring you the answer when we return. You're watching Chapman News. Chicago, home of the Stanley Cup champion, Chicago Blackhawks, and this city loves Chapman News. Welcome back to Chapman News. I'm Julie Vacera. And I'm Diane Gersenfeld. Thanks for staying with us. It's been an exciting week in sports for Southern California. That's right. And history was made in Anaheim earlier this week. Yes, indeed. And you better believe it. Angels starter Jared Weaver made history Wednesday night as he racked up the 21st no-hitter in Angels history. With the victory, the Angels finished up a series sweep of the Minnesota Twins and were looking to make it four in a row Thursday against the Toronto Blue Jays. Let's take a look. Angels throw the no-no Wednesday, nearly no-hit Thursday. Albert Pujols, part of the problem, still has not hit a home run this season and it wasn't happening tonight. In the first with the runner on the ground, ouch, double play. 
Ends the inning. Albert Pujols still looking for that crown in SoCal. More trouble for the Halos. Two on third. J.P. Arisibia takes Dan Aaron deep to left over the bullpens. Three shot. Three run shot gives the Blue Jays the 3-0 lead. His second home run of the season. Angels not getting it done either. Mark Trumbo still having a tough time getting used to his new position. Throws it away. Ouch. Score 5-0 Blue Jays and that is your final score. Irvin Santana on the hill tomorrow still looking for his first win of the season. That loss wasn't the only troubling news coming out of Anaheim Thursday. Talks surface in Anaheim this week of a potential move of the Angels from Orange County to Los Angeles. The lease on Angel Stadium has a clause that could give them an out in 2016, which could allow them to move to L.A. If they do not move by that time, the Angels will remain in Anaheim until at least 2029. This is not the first time owner Arte Moreno has tried to break free from Anaheim after famously changing the name of the franchise from Anaheim Angels to Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim in 2005. Moreno with Angels chairman Dennis Cool met with AEG earlier in the week. Common belief of the proposed site is where Farmers Field would be at LA Live. Angel Stadium is currently the fourth oldest bar ballpark in Major League Baseball. The Clippers recorded one of the NBA's most historic playoff comebacks in Game 1 against the Memphis Grizzlies. The Clips ended the game on a 28-3 run, stunning the home crowd in Memphis who were looking for redemption in Game 2 on Wednesday. And her redemption they would get. Grizzlies out early on the fast break. Rudy Gay gets the slam. His teammates are excited about it. More excited for this. Tony Allen off the steal jams the flashy score. Memphis wins Game 2, 105 to 98. As for the Lakers, they play Game 3 tonight in Denver, currently leading the series two games to none. Kobe Bryant's 38 points in Game 2 has the 83rd time in his career he topped the 30-point mark in, playoff, in a playoff game, second only to Michael Jordan. Bryant spoke with the media about the difference in this year's team. Better. You know, we, you know, last year was you know, so much of a broken season with uh, injuries and myself not being able to practice and things like that, so it was kind of tough to build a rhythm. This year we've... Uh, you know, we've done a great job of that, so it's, you know, we've always been a team that's really paid attention to detail and pretty intelligent team. So, After beating, beating the number one seeded Canucks in game five, in five games, the Los Angeles Kings are now taking it to the two seeded St. Louis Blues. The Kings took games one and two in St. Louis and look to take a 3-0 series lead Thursday as they return to the home crowd at Staples Center. Blues looking for a much-needed victory on the road. Tied at one in the second period. Matt Green finds Dwight King, and he's off. Slips it to top shelf past Blue go Blues goaltender Brian Elliott. King's up 2-1. Later in the second, King's on the power play. Mark Richards, tough angle, shoots the wrister off Elliott and in for a second goal. King's lead. LA still leading in the third. Alex Pietrangelo puts the puck on net. Chris Stewart on the rebound and dipsy doodles by a diving Jonathan Quick to put it home. 3-2 Kings leading. All Kings in this one as Drew Doughty winds up, aims, fires the shot, just trickles past Elliott to put the game away for the Kings. And that's all for sports. Back to you, ladies. Coming up. We know you're getting ready for summer. If you're still looking for plans, we got some cool suggestions. Plus, Nick brings us the weekly entertainment news. What do you got for us, Nick? Coming up in entertainment, Ashton Kutcher's controversial commercial has been banned from TV, but has become an internet sensation. Rihanna's hot new music video hits the web, and a Glee star collapses at a red carpet event in Hollywood. All that and more coming up on entertainment. Follow your dreams. Chapman University. Chemistry, physics, computational science, biology. Start doing research in your first year. Soar to new heights. The Schmidt College of Science at Chapman University. Explore. Welcome back to Chapman News. I'm Diane Gerstenfeld. And I'm Julie Vacera. Up next is my favorite part of the show, entertainment. 
Nick, what do you think about Rihanna's new music video? I hear it gets a little hot and steamy. That's right, Dan. And you know, uh, Rihanna never fails to impress, but we'll get to that in just a second. First, cries of outrage surround a controversial new pop chip commercial starring Ashton Kutcher. The spot features Kutcher mimicking different racial stereotypes, recording interviews for a dating website. The, inter, uh, the ad was meant to poke fun at the type of person who would use an online dating site, but some feel the joke went too far. Monkeys plus robots. But, you know, for around where it counts. Is this his poo-poo? This is a magical feather. It was given to me by a shaman. Would you like it, Jeep? Poo-poo, it's okay. They are kosher. She only eats kosher. Yes. The ad has been pulled from television but has already become an internet sensation. Tweet us at Chapman News and let us know if you think this commercial is too controversial. Now from good girls gone get bad to out of control party girls, fans can't get enough of Rihanna's new hit music video for Where Have You Been All My Life. It started with alerts on the pop star's Facebook fan page. The song which is co-produced by DJ Calvin Harris is accompanied by choreog choreography from Hit Hat who choreograph choreographed the Step Up, the movie Step Up 3, excuse me. Over 9 million fans have watched the video since it hit the web on Monday. And Amber Riley took a dive in an event at the Academy of Arts and Sciences in North Hollywood on Tuesday. The Glee star was posing on the red carpet when all of a sudden she fainted. But not to worry, the actress is doing just fine. She later tweeted, hey guys, I'm okay. Got a little dizzy from all the photog flashes. Amber also wanted to make sure photographers on the red carpet were recognized for their kindness. She tweeted, I'd also like to thank the photographers for being so professional and not taking photographs of me on the ground. I truly appreciate it. It could have been super embarrassing. And the fighters may be unstoppable in the octagon, but now mixed martial arts promoters are facing stern restrictions in California. A proposed bill could allow state regulators to block any MMA promoter from sponsoring an event if that promoter is guilty of a crime. The rule, which comes across as overstepping in the eyes of the fighters, includes language that is designed to protect the fighters from coercive promoters. We don't want to see down the road in a few, a few years down the road in the headlines, five or ten years from now, that there were young MMA fighters who became superstars, but yet were exploited in these types of contracts and in retirement, they're living in poverty. MMA fighters. If passed, a promoter's license would be revoked if he signed a fighter into what the bill calls a quote, Sounds great, except the bill. You may have seen MMA fighters at the Honda Center in the past, but if this bill is passed, you might not be seeing any MMA fighting in Southern California anytime soon. And Los Angeles fans get excited. The group which owns the Hollywood and Highland Center has announced a deal with the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences to keep the prestigious event at the Southern California for 20 more years. The Academy was under fire when the future was unclear who will host the Oscars. When the Kodak company went bankrupt, it was, it was clear the famous Kodak Theater would not host the awards anymore. Though the building will remain the same, the name has now changed to the Hollywood and Highland Center. That's all we've got for you in entertainment today. We miss you, MCA. Ladies, back to you at the desk. Thanks, Nick. Julie, it's hard to believe summer is just around the corner. This year's gone by so fast. That it has, and it's time to start planning. Taylor Neville brings us to our backyard paradise to get us pumped up for sunshine and summertime. Ocean lovers paradise. Come along as we dip our toes in some of my favorite beaches. Located below the Ritz-Carlton, Salt Creek Beach is for the surfers, bodyboarders, and wave jumpers. You can grab a bite to eat at the snack shack while enjoying the gorgeous landscape and the sound of the crashing waves. Second on my list that you just can't miss, Aliso Creek Beach is an easily accessible sandy beach just off PCH. It offers an interactive beach scene with a playground, fire pits, and tide pools for the whole family to explore. The third beach we recommend might take a thousand steps to get to, but it's the best beach to escape the loud crowds of beachgoers. Surrounded by cliffs, natural cave formations, wildflowers, and tide pools, it's a secluded and serene beach great for winding down. I hope we inspired you to catch some fun in the sun. I'm Taylor Neville for Chapman News. Oh my gosh, the water's so cold! 
Thanks, Taylor. I'm going to go have to hit the beach and get a flavor of the summer this weekend. I will be right there with you. And that's all for this week. Thanks for watching Chapman News. I'm Julie Vissera. And I'm Diane Gerstenfeld. Make sure to tune in next week for our last show of the semester, and may the fourth be with you.